Noon on Thursday, folks. Ted Rolson here, joined by Josh Levy in our studios, Think Tech Hawaii, uh, overlooking downtown Honolulu on, uh, on a bright and clear Thursday. And joining us today for our show, Where the Drone Leads, we have Charles Werner standing by in his place in Virginia. Charles, are you there? I'm here. There you go. Okay, and what's cool is that the sun hasn't set in Virginia yet. It hasn't set here, so we got the whole country bathed in bright sunshine right now. And it looks unusual to see a guy as casually dressed as that in Virginia. We normally think of you guys in coats with slurry and sleet and snow and frozen rain in the gutters running around, but it's actually summertime, apparently. It is, and we just recently had some tornadoes. <laughs> okay, so perfect thing for a guy in disaster management to worry about and think about. But it looks like the trees are starting to leaf out, so spring isn't that far away, Charles. And uh, That's right. Thanks for coming on the show, but this is a really important time in our world of drones. We have a drone on the table here to make sure that we don't ever lose sight of the fact that shows about drones, but the whole issue of requirements and standards and user needs is through your efforts and others, but I think primarily yours, is starting to come into focus here. And people are starting to pay attention to the fact that we need to have some form of uh, self-managed regulation in order to go forward in an orderly fashion here and, and serve the uh, the country well. And it looks like uh, folks do not adjust your set. We've got a technical outage here. Charles, can you hear us or have we just lost the video? I'm, I'm here. Okay, you get back out again. All right. So tell us about what you do, Charles, in the Virginia State Department of Emergency Management, how that relates to drones and, and how that led you into this whole world of drone standards. Uh, well, first I started uh, pursuing drones when I was the fire chief in Charlottesville, Virginia, and that was in 2014. Unfortunately, as most people re remember, the rules and regulations from the FAA were not very friendly at that time. So unfortunately, by the year 2015, when I retired from the Charlottesville Fire Department, I was unable to get a UAS program in, in place because of those rules. It wasn't really until 2016 when the rules changed that we were able to, to move up and start taking advantage of that. And specifically about the rules, it was kind of interesting because prior to the rule changes, you had to either be a pilot or you had to go through uh, ground flight school in order to be able to fly an unmanned aircraft system. Um, but then when the FAA changed their law, or not their law, but the rule, it's, it said uh, government agencies could self-certify. That was both good and bad. Uh, it meant that we could now take control of our own destiny, uh, but it really didn't give us a reference standard to go by to say when we had actually done enough to train the remote pilots to do it safely in a way that we could actually have it something to measure against. Uh, and then the Part 107 rules came out in August, and the, the question was, what do we uh, what do we do now in self-certification? Do we do we do part 107? Do we not do part 107? And so then it became a quagmire of we're going to get a COA and now uh, we in Virginia decided that we're going to require, uh, as far as the emergency management office, to, to require all of our remote pilots to be part 107 certified because that's the only reference that's out there now that ensures we understand national airspace. <clears throat> Along the same time, the National Fire Protection Association decided uh, they wanted to move forward in helping to develop standards for public safety remote pilots, the visual observer, and the standards of and requirements of what you're going to have if you did a program. Making sure that people realize when they decide to do UAS that they really know what they're getting into. And that means uh, making sure that we have done everything we can as far as documentation, training, proficiency, um, maintenance records, uh, and all the things that go along with what we know as remote pilots uh, require. And so I was asked to serve as the chair of that committee, and it happens to be the first technical committee from the National Fire Protection Association that's actually multidisciplined. So we actually have fire, law enforcement, EMS, emergency managers, search and rescue, and all those people on it to really help define uh, the standards in this new arena of uh, public safety. So it's, uh, that's, that's the one thing that's happened. In addition to that, um, I've been asked to serve on an SAE committee 
uh, which is also developing a different type of standard for remote pilots. And uh, we, I can't really frame that out for you as to what that looks like right now, but it'll be covering some other aspects uh, of doing that. And then I think you've seen some of the documentation where ANSI actually had a meeting May 19th in Washington, D.C. that really pulled together all of the standards agencies. That was ASTM, NFPA, SAE, of course, the ANSI folks, and a list of others to, to really start capturing what's being done in the area of standards for unmanned aircraft systems such that uh, we can actually be complementing one another and not competing in the standards world because if you have multiple standards, then it gets questionable as to which ones do we decide to use. And that's a really, uh, obviously, an interesting question as to how to have the standards represented by a broad base but also agreed upon by a broad base where there may be a lot of differences, regional, for example. When you men mentioned NFPA, I'm thinking back to the days of uh, uh, before the U.S. had a national fire code, different cities, different counties, different states would have different thread and coupling diameters and, and thread patterns on the hydrants. So the fire hoses from one county wouldn't fit the hydrants from the other county, couldn't work together. So something very straightforward and simple like that, it's gigantically more complex in the world of drones. And Josh thinks in the world of, uh, of the analysis aspects that the products that come from analysis uh, of uh, digital elevation models, disaster models of structures and such, and even that is going to require a lot of uh, harmonization and, and coordination in order to produce standards that are transferable from one to the other. What do you think about that, Josh, in terms of the standards of uh, standards of analysis? Exactly. So but it's not only just standards of analysis, but the standards of the sensors too. So you know, if you're going out there with, you know, if, it, if an organization has six different cameras that they're using, they may all have, um, you know, different resolutions, all these different things that you're going to have to then, um, you know, kind of, um, uh, try and figure out afterwards during the analysis period, um, that's just going to take you more time. So if you have a way to standardize um, all those cameras that are all the exact same, then you can kind of take that extra step out of the workflow to get your products done faster. So a sort of an integration between different kinds of sensors with interface definitions and such. And if our good friend Phil McGilvery, who you haven't met yet, I don't think Charles was with us here on the, on the show, he would tell us even the archiving world requires some form of standards. In fact, the archiving world, in his experience in the Coast Guard, may be the most expensive part of all this and the most complicated part. So this is, Charles, you've inherited quite a task, and you've inherited this three times. You've done it for NFPA, uh, you're doing it for the, uh, the new organization that's been created to represent the uh, public safety people, and you're doing it for the state of Virginia. So uh, you got, uh, you're, you're embedded in this thing, Charles. And, uh, well, once people learn you know something, they all come after you to, to help share it. And it's such an, it's such an immature market that uh, your experience just has asked me, you know, used in multiple ways. If you start with just the NFPA piece, even getting that bunch together, uh, because we have wildland fire people, we have structure fire people, there's uh, grasslands, there's uh, uh, oil fires, uh, there's hazmat type issues, there's so many issues involving fire. How has, how, as an example, how has that progressed in terms of getting people to come up with standards or even suggest what standards might be? Well, now I add into that, not only all those different firefighters, but law enforcement, EMS, emergency management, and search and rescue. So what we, did, what we decided to tackle was, what are the fundamental operations that a remote pilot's going to do that's going to be common to all of them? So the first thing we started off with was, your, your takeoff, your landing, your flights, to create some of the basic fundamentals to start with. And then what we'll do is, over time, we'll continue to refine that into the more of the specialization type thing. So you might have uh, wildfire where they're talking about using them to, to do backfires. And uh, there may be some other things of different types of spectral, multi-spectral cameras, LIDAR, so we're not doing everything at once, so we, we agreed that we would all work on the common areas uh, that would be every single remote pilot, and then we would find more details as we go forward. That's interesting. So you've worked it from the operational perspective, what has to happen regardless of what the sensor or the payload analysis might be. That's, that's really, we could, we could take, we could come at that from the other direction, the, the common product orientation, and think of that side of it as well, and the two could meet in the middle somewhere. That's exactly right. I think the other issue that we have is just what you all were talking about before, 
we we want eventually there to be third party sensors and payloads that we can utilize regardless of the the unmanned aircraft vehicle frame and that's where we create this common interface and that, that comes back to standards so that we actually have the versatility and it doesn't matter hopefully which particular uh, technology we choose for it to be able to to take the payload that's uh uh, sort of a, that, that leads back almost to the instant command system. In fact, one of the questions that we have out here, and it would be interesting to hear your feedback, is exactly where do drones fit within the ICS structure? There's some who have opined that they fit within the air system currently under the air boss or whatever the air ops domain might be in ICS. Others have said, no, it fits more in the intelligence side or the situation side or the information side, maybe the planning side. What have you seen there in terms of a, a best practice uh, in terms of how drones fit into the ICS? Well, I think it actually fits in a couple different places. One, I think it has to fit into planning because you have to plan exactly what it is you want to do as far as the mission. So there is a planning component. But once it goes into the, the operations area, the CONOPS, then it has to be under the operational command. And in this case, my personal opinion, while it still hasn't been totally addressed, would be under an air branch uh, or something similar, because in the past, we, we've had air operations only in limited cases, unless you're in wildfire. Wildfire has, has it uh, more obvious or more often, uh, medical helicopters, those types of things. But now we're potentially seeing air operations on almost every significant incident, and not only with one drone, but multiple drones, because multiple agencies can be coming in from multiple levels of government which raises another question of some standardization, and the this is another topic that we can talk about another time. But UAS traffic management. <laughs> uh, if we can, that, yeah, you know, as you think about these things, well, then we have the various forms of uh, FAA notifications as such, such as the one that we just talked about last week of the uh, the the web-based notification that your flight plan has been accepted, which is supposed to be out on end of the year. There's so much new ways of compiling information and passing it out. It's, uh, and when you mentioned air traffic integration, that's just a whole other domain here beyond, well beyond the emergency management side. So I think I sent a tweet out this morning that said. And, and software on Josh's side over here and products that we create for the end state user. We have the user, not quite sure how to define what those products might be. We have the operations that needs to respect the fact that UAVs have to be associated with the air ops if there is air ops. But as you point out, in some cases, there may not be air ops, or they may not have been uh, kicked off yet. So you have, you could very well have UAS operations occur prior to the formal air boss and air operations uh, apply. And then at the other end, as the thing comes down, uh, you might have the UAS stand down before the major air ops stands down. There's, there's phasing here that we have to think of. Uh, and then there's, as you bring up, there's air traffic integration. Because when we're all done, right. everything wants to go back to base somewhere. Yeah, what I think what we're seeing too is, uh, is there is actually, there's a misconception that if you have an air asset up in the sky, a fixed wing or a helicopter, that that gives you the same kind of visual that you get from, a, from a, an unmanned, unmanned aircraft system. And it's not necessarily true. Sometimes the resolution, the video, the other things that can come from UAS can be a lot closer, can be a lot more refined. And we have actually had a fixed wing helicopter and an unmanned aircraft system flying simultaneously. And there really isn't that much difficulty in doing it as long as you make sure you continue to deconflict the airspace. Let's talk about that airspace integration. And then one more bigger topic that goes beyond all this education and the kind of certifications you do for your people in Virginia after we get back from our, our single break in this show. We'll be back in one minute. Sign a designated driver. Here we go 
Yo, folks, Ted Rolston, Josh Levy in our studio downtown Honolulu Think Tank uh, in our show Where the Drone Leads and our unbelievable guest on this portion of the show, Charles Werner of many affiliations in disaster management, UAS operations, National Fire Prevention Association, uh, ANSI, AUVSI, and it goes on from there. Welcome back, Chuck. Charles, I should say. It's, it's, it's natural okay. to drop to do that to you. Anyway, we were talking uh, about a really complicated subject <clears throat> as the first part of the show went forth here. I think we'd like to get you on at other times here and talk about more elements of this whole concept of UAS in, in the standards world emerges and, and, and evolves. But the education aspect, that, that comes to mind as something that has to capture all of this. That is education we do in our schools, elementary schools, in the workforce development area, in the university. Uh, we have a training program here, for example, at, at University of Hawaii dealing with UAS in agriculture. It really ought to look similar to the UAS in environmental operations or disaster management to the extent there is, as you point out, a common aspect. That is the very common thing, the flight planning, the launching, and the recovery of UAS. But uh, education, uh, we, we, we've also hit the point where we're out of UAS pilots here in this state. If the power company wants one more UAS qualified pilot to their level of qualifications, we don't have any. And uh, so we're gonna mm -hmm. have to generate uh, workforce development training that leads to pilots as well as analysts and, and, uh, and designers. Tell us about the certification program you've put together uh, in Virginia. Uh, we know there's one in Virginia, there's one in Texas, but we're going to need to do something like that out here. And uh, maybe you need to make a trip out here, Charles, shortly, and help us out. Uh, well, that seems to be the invitation I'm getting a lot in a lot of different places. Um, what we did is we uh, actually, it was interesting that uh, one of the instructors, a, a person, uh, one of the friends of mine who's in the National Guard, and I had gone to our community college separately and unbeknownst to each other, and requested that the community college think about doing a program to train remote pilots. Uh, he was looking at it just from the standpoint of uh, a job or an employment opportunity. I was looking at it from a public safety perspective. We kind of put our heads together and created a, one of the first emergency responders for our unmanned aircraft vehicles uh, courses. And what that did basically is started off with giving classroom days, the first day being national airspace, the second day being the technology, of unmanned aircraft vehicle itself and the payloads and the day three was indoor flying and day four and five were actually scenario based flying depending on who the students were so we actually allowed the customization of that to be um, dependent on who was in the class so if it was law enforcement we might do an active shooter situation if it was a hazmat individual we might do a hazmat situation and and so on and that kind of uh, gave us that uh, experiential learning and a, a chance to test it out so that becomes a week-long program Right, and you provide the equipment for the students. Yeah, yeah. They have to do some pre-reading uh, or pre-studying of some kind, I'm sure. When they, they're not gonna get, get a 107 out of that, so they're gonna have to do something else to get themselves uh, qualified with the FAA, is that right? Yes, and I don't wanna necessarily give away uh, an advertisement for anybody, but we found an online program that uh, is very good video uh, very affordable, affordably priced, which you can work at your own pace. And by the time you get done with this class, I guarantee you will be prepared to take part 107. In Virginia, we're actually going to use that as our prerequisite from this point forward for all of our people who wish to be remote pilots because it does cover so many bases, all the national airspace. So now we get into it, it's more of us talking about the operational aspects and the flying. Okay, so that's great because the 107 gives you, once again, a common standard, a common understanding of air ops and uh, air sensitivity and such. And uh, once that's in place, now you can build the, the actual operation uh, on, that, on that base of knowledge. So, um, so, sorry, can I jump in? So sure, after please. these, sorry, uh, so after, after these, <laughs> no, this is your show, Ted. Um, so after these firefighters and, has, and hazmat people have gone and gone through a week training, you know, where does that put them on the on the scale of, you know, can they go out the next day and start conducting operations? Or, you know, obviously once they have the 107, but or do they need, you know, a couple of more weeks of just kind of training themselves once they already have the background knowledge? Uh, that's where the next level is defining per your agency, the level of proficiency that you want to have until such time that standards are in place. So there are no standards currently to tell you what that's supposed to be. And for the time being, 
you're going to have to make that make that up on your own as to individual agencies, organizations, uh, and that's that's the point of and the reason why the standards become so necessary. So if you use the NFPA standards as a reference, um, just much like fire apparatus, we have different levels of fire apparatus. So you take the basic course of apparatus operations, but then you you take individualized classes as you go up in complexity. So an engine operator will have one certification, an aerial operator becomes different certification. So the same thing would be applicable in the area of unmanned aircraft systems. As you go up in size, scale, complexity, that would require another proficiency certification, if you will, to allow you to fly those things. So for now, you're kind of on your own to make it up, but you you, you kind of there are a lot of uh, best practices out there from other departments that you can talk to. Austin, Texas, uh, I think there's some North Dakota departments. Um, York County, Virginia has a sheriff fire combination. They've got a lot of policies and procedures and, and training requirements. So that's the other part of the National Council's purpose is to create a website that provides access to information. Uh, and that's publicsafetyuas.org that we're in the process of adding a portal to so that you can actually go find the best practices, the policies, the procedures, what other departments are doing and help to expedite that process for you. That's great. So two, two big subjects in that conversation in response to Josh's question. One is the National Council for UAS in Public Safety, which you are the chair of, and we need to have you describe that a little bit more to us. Uh, and also uh, the fact that a staged and graduated uh, entrance into the game would be what you get after you graduate from one of these classes. So, and your example of other apparatus, uh, you certainly wouldn't put a recent graduate in charge of an airplane or a fire truck right up front. You, you learn in the right seat before you go to the left seat. So uh, that's, that's really all great uh, models for us to think about. Tell us about the National Council a little bit and how we can get involved with that. Well, first of all, anybody can get involved. Um, it's uh, we now have I think 33 organizations, which include almost all the national public safety organizations, including the the uh, the AOPA, which is the Pilots Association. Uh, we now brought on the National Association of State Aviation uh, Officers because we want to be able to do integration at airports, and so we need to have those people on board. Um, but what it does is we're going to set up different committees that people can participate in. So you can become an associate member as far as your organization. You can become an individual member, work on committee work. But the whole idea is we we understand and realize this is such an immature market that there's very little experience. The point was we've seen everybody reinventing the wheel. And it was time that we started sharing not only between uh, our common public safety disciplines, but across the disciplines between fire, police, EMS, search and rescue, emergency management, all the different players and academia so that we can actually say, how do we want to be training people? What do we want it to look like? What are the policies and procedures so that we're not all doing the same thing over and over again? And that's, uh, we also learned from the FAA that they said, you know, it would be great if we had this one collective that could bring the ideas forward. Otherwise, we have 33 agencies that are all bringing different ideas forward. They're all similar, but a little bit different. So it makes it harder to get that single message. This, this gives us one single voice that actually gives an amplification of what it is we're looking for and then hoping to develop, as you all mentioned earlier, some of those requirements that say we want these third party sensors to be able to be interchangeable amongst that and that we as public safety aren't going to buy it unless it has it. So that's that's part of how this all comes together and we start getting a collective idea and start working things to make it better. So you're kind of coming, becoming the underwriter's laboratory or the consumer reports orientation in terms of the, the particular world of unmanned air systems entering into public safety. I, obviously, we have a lot of research to do, Josh. We've got to get on the website and we've got to join and we've got to start participating. Uh, you know, Charles, the, the issue of requirements, that, that never ends. And um, I'm sure you know, you hear my telling you that. But one that intrigues me is that of, de of uh, dependability or dependence. That is, when a fireman depends on his uh, Scott Air Pack, or when a policeman depends on his, uh, on his uh, Motorola radio, there's a certain expectation of its performance. As we start depending on unmanned air systems to perform critical missions, uh, just information collection may be a critical mission, re uh, communication relay, dropping off medicines as time goes on, that sort of thing. We're going to have to establish some reliability and, uh, and beyond safety, functional reliability that systems are going to have to achieve. Has that arrived at, at the discussion level within either NFPA or the uh, ANSI activity yet? 
I think that's what everybody is really hitting at is they realize that if we if we use the military model, we've seen that uh, very quickly the unmanned aircraft system becomes a mission critical component. Uh, so we can we can anticipate that that is going to be happening, and and so we are going to have preparing for that. And in fact, I met with DHS today, and and uh, DHS was basically saying this to the Department of Homeland Security that there's three things that we really have to be concerned about, and that's safety, security, and reliability. And so that does come into the standards process of making sure we've covered all three of those bases. Safety, security, and reliability. Yes. Okay, three flags that fly over the uh, UAS Capitol here. Uh, that's great. Uh, uh, I can't personally thank you enough for what you're doing, all this time you're spending, all this leadership you're contributing to these multiple organizations and the insight you bring forward. I wish we could. I wish you had an RS-232 plug we could plug in and get some of that uh, flowing out this way. We'll have to do that by getting you on an airplane and getting you out here sometime. Uh, we have um, activities with the National Guard coming up before the hurricane season uh, very shortly. Uh, we have activities with some sports events that are of international scale that are going to be asking for assistance and support. I'd like to take the opportunity to relay those back to you as, as, uh, as we get them developed for your feedback. We, of course, we can't ask for you. Everybody else is asking for you 24 hours a day. We can't uh, add too much to that, but we'll load you up, Charles, and, uh, uh, and get as much uh, uh, assistance going back your way from our experience out here, which probably is different in the tropics. We have saltwater in incursion, for example, in circuit boards, which may, not, may or may not be a factor in Virginia. But uh, what an activity you're leading, and it's great that we're finally getting that level of um, mature leadership in the industry here in terms of getting standards and getting things that will turn this into a, a, a reliable and trusted uh, part of the infrastructure. And uh, Josh, any thoughts on your part from the, the analysis side of this and, and the products that we develop for our users? Uh, I mean, I'm just excited to see where this all leads and seeing, you know, how we can better, you know, as, as we've said, you know, standardize, you know, the sensors, the analysis protocols, even the software that's used to create these products um, where we're not all comparing and contrasting like, oh, you know, I'm using X software and that's going to give me a different product from B software. So let's just kind of, let's take that out of the equation and just make sure everything's all standardized so we can you know, go about and get delivering the best results that we can. And we have this, the other side of that is we have to continue to promote advances in industry in terms of miniaturization, higher reliability, lower cost, and so the standards issue will forever be dealing with new technology coming into it. And, uh, but that's good. It's, it's time, it's got here. In 1927, the FAA was created, was created out of a morass of, of, uh, of bad stuff going on in the U.S. Uh, this, the FAA got created out of the CAA back in 1970 or there, 65 or so, for the same reason, and now we're doing the same thing for UAS. So it's good that it's coming to the front, and Charles, you're the guy to lead it, and we're going to learn as much from you as we can. And uh, at this point, we're going to be signing off at the end of our show, and thank you very much, Charles Warner in Virginia, for sticking with us on, on this uh, Thursday. And uh, anything we can do for you, please let us know. And we'll get you back yeah. on the show again. Uh, as soon as you want to do it. Absolutely. Happy flying. Okay, thanks a lot. We'll see you.